I'm Ann Burke. I'm a lawyer. I'm a third-generation Kansas lawyer. I'm a third-generation KU Law School graduate. And I'm a sixth-generation Kansan. I am proud to be from a state which was the first state to ban the Ku Klux Klan. I am proud to be from a state which was one of the first state to elect women to public office. A state which is a leader and has been a progressive leader in child labor laws. A state which was described by journalist Jason Probst in an article for the Hutchinson newspaper entitled, Obituary for the State of Kansas. Has anyone read it? If you haven't read it, Google it, an obituary for the state of Kansas, where he described a state before it died was preceded in death by fair taxation, good highways, strong education, open government, and political moderation. I am proud of my Kansas roots, and that's why I am here today to speak with you about the importance of a fair and independent judiciary. My family has had a longtime interest in Kansas government. While most of my family has had ties to the legislative branch, my interest has always been in the judiciary. I knew I wanted to go to law school when I was 12, and I read Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. I knew I wanted to be able to advocate for clients, particularly those who might be disadvantaged or whose cause might be unpopular. I have practiced for 33 years, and I have served my profession through service to the Kansas Bar Foundation, the Kansas Bar Association, and the University of Kansas Law School. I presently serve as chair of the Kansas Supreme Court Nominating Commission. Thank you. I'll speak a little bit more about the commission in a little while, but first I wanted you to understand a little bit about my background so that you can understand the depth of my concern about this current system of judicial selection and the attacks we are suffering on that system. As we all learned in school, there are three branches of government established by the Kansas Constitution, the executive, legislative, and judicial. Through this system of separation of powers, we have checks and balances, and this is important so that no branch becomes too powerful. Each of the branches has some authority to act on its own. Each of the branches has authority to regulate the other two branches to a certain extent, and each has some of its own authority regulated by the other two branches. While we think of the executive branch mostly when, as the governor, um, the, the executive branch also consists of the lieutenant governor, the secretary of state, the attorney general, the state treasurer, and the insurance commissioner. The legislative branch of government is responsible for making and maintaining laws. Members of both of the House of Representatives and Senate are elected by the voters of Kansas. The ju judicial system of Kansas is the branch of Kansas state government which interprets the state laws and constitution. It's headed by the Supreme Court and the judiciary consists in Kansas of two courts of last resort, the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals, and numerous courts of general jurisdiction and limited jurisdiction spread throughout the state. The Kansas Supreme Court consists of seven members who are headed by a chief justice. The Kansas Court of Appeals consists of 14 members headed by a chief judge. These courts uphold the rights of individuals and businesses and they decide cases by applying the Kansas Constitution, laws passed by the legislature, and prior case law. These three branches of government assure that a balance of power, governing power is divided into three separate branches to prevent corruption of one branch from overtaking the entire government. The Kansas Supreme Court was, was created by the Kansas Constitution, and the method of selecting the Supreme Court justices are governed, is governed by the Kansas Constitution under a method called merit selection. 
The method of selection, since it's established by the Constitution, can only be changed by two-thirds of the vote of, a, of the House of Representatives, two-thirds of the vote of the Senate, and then put on a ballot for the people of Kansas to vote upon. So to change the method of selection of our Supreme Court justices would require a constitutional amendment. The Kansas Court of Appeals, however, is a creature of statute. In other words, the legislative statutes, not the Constitution, created the Kansas Court of Appeals. As such, the system of selecting judges for the Kansas Court of Appeals is also governed by statute, which can be amended by a simple majority of the legislature. The Kansas Court of Appeals is not included in the Constitution because it wasn't established until 1977. When the Court of Appeals was created in 1977, the legislature adopted the merit selection system of selecting Court of Appeals judges because the, the system was working so well for the Kansas Supreme Court. Which leads me to, how did merit selection come about in Kansas? And it's kind of an interesting piece of history. In 1956, Governor Fred Hall found himself at the center of a scandal called the Triple Play. He tried to install himself as the Chief Justice of the Kansas Supreme Court <laughs> after, lo re after losing his, his reelection bid for governor. Near the end of the term, his term, both Governor Hall and Chief Justice, and the Chief Justice, who, who was a friend of his, resigned and the lieutenant governor quickly installed former Governor Hall as the new Chief Justice. That was the lieutenant governor's only official act during the 11 days he served as governor. Prior to the triple play, Kansas allowed the governor to fill any judicial vacancies. The legislature then realized the danger and potential abuse of power in allowing a governor to fill judicial vacancies. So following that scandal, Kansans voted to amend the Kansas Constitution to the merit-based system of selecting Kansas Supreme Court justices. And for nearly 60 years, and up until last year, the merit-based system has worked well under both Democratic and Republican administrations to ensure fair and impartial courts that are insulated from partisan pressure. The merit-based system is effectuated by the Kansas Supreme Court Nominating Commission. So what is this Kansas Supreme Court Nominating Commission? The commission is composed of four laypersons who are appointed by the governor from each of the four congressional districts in Kansas. The commission also includes five lawyers who are elected from all of the lawyers who reside in each of the four congressional districts. And they, they aren't elected by the Bar Association. You don't have to be a member of the Bar Association if you're a lawyer in Kansas. They're elected by every licensed lawyer to practice law in Kansas in their judicial district. And then the chair, which is the position I hold, is elected by all of the law licensed lawyers in Kansas. I've served on the commission for six years. All commission members serve four-year terms and are eligible to re be reelected or reappointed for one additional four-year term. So I'm halfway through my second term. When a vacancy on the court is announced, every licensed lawyer in Kansas is given notice and invited to apply for that position. Historically, the number of applicants has been, depending on the position, between 12 and 35 applica applicants for a vacancy. The commission conducts exhaustive and extensive background checks. This includes credit checks, criminal background checks, ethical misconduct reports, and compliance with continuing legal education requirements. The commission reads dozens of applications, letters of reference, and legal writings submitted by each applicant. The commission talks to judges and other lawyers in the applicants' communities who have knowledge about each candidate. And then the commission interviews each candidate in Topeka at the Judicial Center, and the interviews are open to the public. Any commissioner can ask any question of the candidates that he or she wants and is also free to do any research or background check on any and all of the candidates. 
I estimate that each commission member spends at least 10 hours per candidate prior to convening in Topeka for interviews which last at least one day, mostly two, and sometimes three days. The commission then selects three candidates and passes them their names onto the governor for his ultimate selection. Now this is for the Kansas Supreme Court only. Everything was wonderful in this process until Governor Brownback decided it wasn't. His first year in office, he set his sights on the process of judicial selection. He called the process of merit selection unconstitutional. So he sued me. And I'm stealing from Kevin McWhorter, the previous um, speaker. He sued me. It's true. In September of 2012, I was named in my capacity as the Supreme Court Nominating Commission Chair as a defendant in a federal court case called Duell versus Burke, which sought to hold merit selection in Kansas, a process used for 60 plus years and utilized by about two thirds of the other states in the country, tried to call it unconstitutional. Did I mention that what I do and the commission members do is an unpaid position? The federal district court for the District of Kansas held merit selection to be constitutional. The Brownback crew appealed to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed the decision of the lower court holding merit selection to be constitutional. And the United States Supreme Court declined to hear the case. So when Brownback's unconstitutional approach failed, he resorted to trying to change the statute for the selection of judges for vacancies on the Court of Appeals. Because remember, it's a creature of statute. You just need a majority vote of the legislature. It doesn't require a constitutional amendment like it does for the Supreme Court. Those efforts to change the Court of Appeals method of judicial selection failed until 2012, when Governor Brownback's brand of Republicans gained control of the Kansas Senate and with the assistance of big money and outside special interests. The legislature did away with merit selection for the Court of Appeals by amending the statute to provide for the so-called federal model where the governor appoints the judge and the Senate confirms his appointment. The Republicans completely cut out a huge piece of an otherwise successful judicial selection process. Now the governor has full control over the Court of Appeals and the public has no direct role in selecting their judges or providing key insight. We don't know who has applied for the vacancy. We don't know their qualifications. We don't know what vetting they received, or in fact, who vets them. We don't know anything about their temperament, their character, their legal experience, or their intellectual capacity. We don't know anything about their credit, their criminal background, or their, whether they've even met the ethical requirements uh, required by the uh, state of Kansas to practice law or be a judge. So up until last year, both higher courts were selected by merit selection, and that means they're selected by their merit, not by their popularity, or their politics, or who they know, or who knows them. Now only the Supreme Court is selected under that process, and I can guarantee you it's going to come under challenge as well. In Governor Brownback's State of the Union address last year, he called the Supreme Court Nominating Commission a, a committee of special interests. <laughs> special interests? Well, I guess if they mean, uh, in terms of the lawyer members of the commission, those lawyers who are interested in the integrity of the court system in which we work every day, I guess we do have a special interest. Yeah. 
And the committee is composed of lay people too, men and women um, that from various backgrounds, different areas of business. The lawyers, he, he suggests that the lawyers move in some monolithic fashion. Lawyers across the state of Kansas are men, they're women, they're Republican, they're Democrat, they're independent, they're apathetic, they're involved, they're mothers, they're fathers, uh, they're liberals, they're conservatives. We're not all the same. A commission-based appointment can offer important benefits to the state judiciary. First and foremost, the judicial candidates do not have to have political connections. They don't have to have a campaign war chest or support of special interests to apply. Rather, the process creates an environment in which the selection decision focuses on the individual candidate, his or her experience, character, qualifications, not their political pensions. And qualified candidates may be more motivated to throw their hat in the ring. I have recent experience with this, with, with this uh, phenomenon. If you knew, as, as an applicant for a judicial vacancy, that your name was going to be sent to the governor's with the name of his friend and his former legal counsel, no matter how brilliant or ethical or committed you are to be a great judge, would you apply? Would you put yourself through that process? I've been to countless robing ceremonies for judges. I can't tell you how many, of, how many of the judges say, if it weren't for merit selection, they wouldn't be there. They have no political connections. They don't know any politicians. They don't have big money to contribute. But they participate in a merit selection process with the consideration of a commission composed of lawyers and citizens across the state from all walks of life people who simply care about the law. I have had the privilege of investigating and considering judicial candidates for appellate courts for the last six years. They are quite simply lawyers and judges who read, sleep, and breathe the law. Their idea of a good bedside read <laughs> is an article about some obscure legal topic they're interested in or maybe a biography about their favorite jurist. <laughs> Without judicial independence, causes, perhaps politically unpopular or controversial at the time, would not have been served. We take, for example, Brown versus State Board of Education, the famous US Supreme Court case emanating from our own state of Kansas, which abolished segregation in public schools. Kansas has had a long time devotion and commit commitment to making public education a priority. In the 60 years after Brown versus State Board of Education was decided, as Ryan White, your luncheon speaker, has pointed out in the past, it's disturbing to see the parallels between the backlash the US Supreme Court experienced when it decided Brown versus State Board of Education and the backlash our Supreme Court is experiencing now in the wake of the public school financing decision. These two courts in Kansas protected the constitutional rights of the less powerful, children, black children and poor children. In the 50s, the US Supreme Court faced massive criticism and now our Kansas Supreme Court is facing the same type of criticism for holding legislative action which cut payments to poor school districts violates our state constitution. Well, that was their job. <laughs> Appellate courts in Kansas must sometimes issue opinions which are displeasing to the executive branch or displeasing to the legislature or indeed displeasing to the public at large. But that's what our courts are supposed to do make unpopular decisions sometimes. And our courts are supposed to be independent and impartial. 
Put yourself in the shoes of a party to a lawsuit. When you face the judge, do you want the judge to consider your political party in deciding your case? Do you want the judge to have received a large uh, donation from your opponent's attorney? Do you want your judge to have perhaps received a large donation from your opponent? Do you want the best judge or the best judge money can buy? Do you want the judge to have specific opinions about an issue that you oppose? Do you want your judge to consider public opinion on the issue you oppose? Of course not. Why is it important to have impartial judges? They are crucial to making sure the justice system, justice system works in our system of democracy. This way, any person or any organization has a fair chance of getting their side heard. It allows the common man or woman to have equal footing when challenging the government or challenging a big business. And it allows organizations and businesses to get a full and fair hearing when they are accused of wrongdoing. It allows an unpopular position to be heard. Ultimately, impartial judges make sure everyone's rights are protected as defined by state and federal law and the Constitution. You know what you may hear from the other side is the phrase activist judge and legislating from the bench. What does that mean? When a judge decides a case, he or she looks at the law or the Constitution and applies the facts of that case to the law and the law to the facts of that case. Sometimes when people disagree with a judge's ruling, they may say the judge's decision is wrong and that the judge misinterpreted the law, meaning he's an activist judge, or changed the meaning of the law with their ruling, meaning she legislated from the bench. Our system is already set up to determine if a judge makes a legal mistake. Trial court's decisions are reviewable by the higher courts, and an, appeal, an appeals court is the appropriate place for those challenges to be heard. Also, lawmakers can change the law if current legislation is not having its intended outcome. Judges' decisions are questioned all the time by the losing side, but just because you disagree with a judge's decision doesn't mean the judge is an activist, nor does it mean that the judge is changing the law to suit his or her personal purposes. Judges must possess character, they must possess superior intellectual skills, they must possess integrity, impartiality, and a willingness to decide cases on the evidence presented and on the law, not on politics, not on agendas, not on special interest groups, and not out of a fear of unpopularity. In To Kill a Mockingbird, Atticus Finch said this, but there is one way in this country in which all men are created equal. There is one human institution that makes a pauper the equal of a Rockefeller, the stupid man the equal of an Einstein, and the ignorant man the equal of any college president. That institution, ladies and gentlemen, is a court. It can be the Supreme Court of the United States, or it can be the lowest magistrate court in the land. Our courts have faults as with any human institution, but in this country, our courts are the grand levelers, and in our courts, all men are created equal. Ladies and gentlemen, let's keep it that way. Remember in November. <laughs> <laughs>